This week, the Alabama House and Senate passed a series of bills to protect in vitro fertilization, or IVF, in the state, which comes just two weeks after the state's Supreme Court handed down a decision that declared that embryos, including cryogenically frozen embryos stored for IVF, have the same rights as children. The backlash to that ruling was swift. IVF clinics across the state paused treatments out of fear of violating the law under the new ruling, but within days, conservatives were backpedaling, calling on the state of Alabama to protect IVF. So, moving with unusual haste, both the Republican-controlled Senate and the House passed identical bills that grant citizens immunity from civil or criminal liability if an embryo is destroyed. Now, as confusing and radical as the original ruling was, the concurring opinion from the Alabama Chief Justice, Tom Parker, stands out as particularly notable. Chief Justice Parker wrote in his concurrence that Alabama had a, quote, theologically based view of the sanctity of life adopted by the people of Alabama encompasses the following. God made every person in his image. Two, each person therefore has a value that far exceeds the ability of human beings to calculate. And three, human life cannot be wrongfully destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy God. Now, if you're surprised to see this kind of language in a legal opinion, perhaps you shouldn't be. The very same day that the IVF ruling came down, Chief Justice Parker appeared on a video podcast hosted by a conservative QAnon-believing self-proclaimed prophet. God created government. And the fact that we have let it go yeah. into the possession of others is heartbreaking for those of us who understand, and we know it is for him. And that's why he is calling and equipping people to step back into these mountains right now. Step back into these mountains right now. That's Alabama Chief Justice Parker. And if you look closely, you'd see what it says behind him. Restore the seven. That's a reference to the seven mountains mandate or the seven mountains dominion, which is a Christian evangelical and Pentecostal belief that urges its followers to establish God's kingdom on earth by controlling the seven mountains of society. Family, religion, education, arts and entertainment, commerce, media, and government. And as Parker said, he believes that God created government and that God is calling and equipping people to step back into those mountains of society. Now, this might sound fringe, but the beliefs behind the Seven Mountains ideology and specifically the ideologically driven effort to get believers into powerful positions in our government is not fringe at all. U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson recently said that he believes the separation of church and state is, quote, a misnomer. In an interview on CNBC, Johnson said that he believes the founders did not want the government to encroach upon the church, not that they didn't want principles of faith to have influence on our public life. It's exactly the opposite, end quote. Shortly after he became speaker, Johnson was apparently not aware that there was media in the room when he compared himself to Moses while speaking about his ascension to the speakership in a speech to conservative lawmakers. This week, a state senator in Oklahoma made a statement about the death of a non-binary teenager named Nex Benedict, who was beaten in a school bathroom the day before they died. The senator said, quote, we're going to fight to keep that filth out of the state of Oklahoma because we are a Christian state, end quote. Another political action group that follows similar beliefs called My God Votes aims to rally believers to get involved in government and to vote for their endorsed candidates. The pastor who ran its inaugural event in, uh, last month in Houston started off by listing the many people who will be on the ballot during this primary who were in attendance, including a candidate for Congress, state senators, state representatives, school board officials, and sheriffs. And then he said this. I want to start off by saying this is not a political event. <laughs> and I say that with all sincerity, because what we're doing here tonight is kingdom business. Uh, this is God's business. Those who serve in office are called God's ministers for good. And it says that he is not a minister. Um, he, he is a minister to execute uh, wrath on those who practice evil. And so we have a line of defense that we elect and put in office to execute wrath. They call him God's avenger. All you who are elected people, I want you to know you are God's avenger to execute wrath against evil. So thank you. 
for serving in God's kingdom tonight. You are God's avenger to execute wrath against evil. There have been rulings and bills in Oklahoma, Texas, Utah, and Idaho that allow those states to bring religious practices into public schools or to use public funds for religious schools. I could go on. There are seemingly endless examples of recent blurring of the line or overt tearing down of the line between church and state. But our founders, the very first thing they decided to fix with the role of religion in this country, the First Amendment written in 1791 reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment or of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, which is the one we normally associate with this amendment, or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The very first amendment. What the founders meant by establishment has been debated intermittently since this was written, but despite many challenges to the so-called establishment clause, the Supreme Court affirmed the separation of church and state repeatedly over decades. However, in the last two years, this very conservative U.S. Supreme Court has delivered a series of blows to the Establishment Clause, allowing prayer in school, allowing businesses to deny service to LGBTQ plus individuals, allowing public funds to go toward religious schools. Meanwhile, Trump is capitalizing on the momentum of the religious right, promising to fight for the Christian right, all the while his team organizes a plan of action that is steeped in Christian nationalism. Joining me now is Caroline Corbin. She's a professor and dean's distinguished scholar at the University of Miami School of Law. She specializes in interpreting the speech and religion clauses in the First Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, professor Corbin, thank you for being with us. We appreciate your time. Uh, a, a lot of the most conservative, most Christian lawmakers consider themselves to be constitutional literalists. Alabama Chief Justice Tom Parker is a self-described constitutionalist. And during that interview in, uh, in which he said, I believe that God created government, he also said he was a constitutional and carries around a pocket constitution with him. D does his not have the First Amendment in it? Exactly. I mean, the very first part of the First Amendment is the Establishment Clause, which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And that basically means that the government should not have an official or favorite religion. And there are a lot of very good reasons why the Establishment Clause prohibits that. For example, it protects the civil peace. If, con if, uh, if a government, any government could have a favorite religion, then you're gonna have competition among various religions to try and become the favorite, and that would cause strife. The separation of church and state actually protects the favored religion because any time religion gets intimately involved with the government, it invariably compromises its integrity. And finally, the government's not supposed to have a favorite religion because it undermines both the equality and the religious liberty of religious minorities. What about uh, Mike Johnson's argument that, that we're all seeing this uh, incorrectly, that the, 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 the First Amendment, uh, the, the Establishment Clause was meant to say that the, the, the government shouldn't impose on, on religion? His argument is that it was meant to protect religious liberty, and he's not wrong, but it protects the religious liberty of religious minorities by ensuring that the government doesn't favor another religion, because that invariably does harm religious minorities. I mean, you see that, um, for example, the government is not supposed to lead prayers, right? We should not have government or even public schools lead prayers in schools. Uh, that has long been part of the Establishment Clause, because otherwise students may feel pressured to participate in prayers that are not their own. And so their own religious liberty, their religious views that do not happen to match the prayers that the school is issuing, their own religious liberty would be compromised. And so, yes, it absolutely does protect religion, but it protects it by ensuring the government does not get in the business of um, practicing religion or imposing religious beliefs on everyone. So look, not everybody sees uh, these things as um, as directly impactful to them uh, and their beliefs. The separation of ch church and state as a constitutional matter seems straightforward enough. But if you start to look to our day-to-day our -day lives in America, you can see where the confusion begins. We have in God we trust 
on our currency. Um, uh, we say that we are one nation under God in our Pledge of Allegiance. How does that, how do you, how do you square that with the Establishment Clause? I would say, uh, personally, I think it does violate the Establishment Clause, but we have never, you know, we have ideals in this country, and we have them with respect to a lot of different areas. We also have them with respect to religion. They're not always realized. And I think that is an example where we have failed to really fully respect what's required under the Establishment Clause. I want to ask you about the impact of these series of cases that took aim at the Establishment Clause directly or indirectly in recent years. It feels like we had decades of relative consistency about this, and now we suddenly don't. Sounds like we've changed directions on this. Absolutely. I mean, there have been... The Establishment Clause has had various areas where it has, as I mentioned, forbidden the government from leading prayers so that people don't feel coerced into participating in a religious exercise. It has forbidden the government from sort of installing religious iconography or religious symbols, lest it seem like it is endorsing one particular religion at the expense of others. And it has forbidden the government from directly funding religious exercises. And in each of these areas, we have seen the Supreme Court cut back on traditional protections. So prayers in school what used to be absolutely beyond the pale for the Establishment Clause. But in a recent case, we saw the Supreme Court countenance a Christian coach saying prayers immediately after football games in the middle of a football field, even though his um, players and others were around him. In terms of Christian symbols, the Supreme Court recently upheld the government's 40-foot Latin cross, which seems like, again, directly contradictory to what we, the Establishment Clause is meant to impose. And finally, the question with government funding of religion used to be, does giving taxpayer money to this religious organization violate the Establishment Clause? And now the question has become, is the government's failure to give taxpayer money to a religious organization violate that religious organization's free exercise, which simply turns on its head our traditional concerns with regard to government funding? Uh, it's not even noon, and I am signing up to get my continuing ed education credit this morning. We really appreciate this. You have schooled us in uh, in this important matter. Professor Caroline uh, Corbin is a professor of law and a dean's distinguished scholar at the University of Miami School of Law.